Brucham Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. And um, this week we're going to begin a discussion on the My Thoughts. There's a concept, the beginning is connected to the end. And that's what we'll be talking about today. There's a statement that we find in the Sefer Yitzhira, the Book of Creation. Uh, chapter 1, Mishnah 7, it states that the beginning is connected at the end. What exactly does that mean? We have just finished the reading the last portion in the first book of the Torah, the book of Genesis, the book of Horatius, creation. It is called Vayechi, which translates to mean, and he lived. The portion tells us about the death and the burial of our father Jacob, Yaakov. first portion of the book carries the same name as the whole book, Bereshit, in the beginning. It, of course, tells us about God creating the world in six days and resting on the seventh. However, the main event in creation was the creation of the first man, Adam, the crown jewel of creation. Everything in the world was created for him, one man. Now, the book of Horatius ends with the death of Yosef, who was to become the central figure in the whole book. It's interesting in that there are as many sedras, portions, that recall the life of Yosef as there are about the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, a house of God on earth. What was there about Yosef's life <clears throat> and the building of the Mishkan that demanded so much attention in the Torah? I think one reason as to why there are so many portions concerning both Yosef and the building of the tabernacle is that they both have a common theme, which is, a proud father, recounting how his child had misbehaved grievously, and then bragging about how his same child had turned his life around and become a model citizen. Yose began his life as a spoiled child, with dreams of grandeur, caring for his looks, a totally self-centered person. But in the end, he grows into a compassionate person interpreting other people's dreams. He even interprets the dreams of a king and becomes a world leader. He deals with the world with world situations, seeing himself as only a servant, a messenger of God in this world. He is the only one of our Jewish ancestors that is called Sadiq, righteous. He is the poster boy. He is the role model. He shows us that it is possible for an Orthodox Jew to live in a secular world and retain his religiosity. With the tabernacle, the nation had sinned grievously. God had given them his most precious gift on Mount Sinai, the Torah. And yet 40 days later, they made a golden calf. To show the nation that, and the world that they were forgiven, God has them build a magnificent tabernacle. He wanted a home on earth so that he could reside in their midst. God, as their father, was very proud of their repentance. And like any father, seeing a wayward child turn their life around and succeed is a great sense of joy. So if the end is connected to the beginning, what do Yosef, the last person mentioned in the Torah, and Adam, the first person mentioned in the Torah, have in common? Adam began his life in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, paradise. His stay was cut short because of the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge. The sin was brought on by the sin of Lush and Hara the tail-bearing of the Nachash. The Nachash, again, the snake, Adam fell into the trap of the Nachash, who spoke lush and hard about God, which brought about his expulsion from the garden. The Yosef lived in peace and tranquility with his father in the land of Canaan. But because he spoke lush and hara about his brothers, he was sold by them into slavery in Egypt. Unknowingly, Egypt would be the place where he would spend the rest of his life in many different positions. So we see that the sin of Lush and Hara was a common denominator in both of their lives. Both suffered because of it. Adam was able to remain righteous himself, but he was only able to elevate one of his sons. He could not save the world from being destroyed other than one occasion with the wives of Lemech. There is no mention in the Torah of Adam having any influence on his descendants. Yosef, on the other hand, was not only able to help his two sons reach their potential, 
He merited to see them exceed, exceed their potential by becoming patriarchs to two of the tribes of the children of Israel. All this was done in an environment that was in total opposition to God and his values. Not only were they idol worshipers, Egypt was known as the most immoral and depraved country in the world. Yosef was able to establish a land of Goshen as a haven for his family, a place where they would be able to retain their high spiritual level without being influenced by any Egyptian neighbors. You know, there's a measure that says that the argument between Yosef and his brothers was actually philosophical. The brothers felt that Judaism was connected to the land, that one could only serve God as a Jew if he resided in the land. Their logic was not without proof. We know that our forefathers, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, only kept the Torah in the land of Israel. That was the reason given how Yaakov was able to marry two sisters, something that's against Torah law. Yosef, on the other hand, felt that serving God was not dependent on location. God is everywhere, and a Jew has an obligation to serve him everywhere, wherever one finds themselves, even in a place of immorality and deprivation, even in Egypt. So the brothers said, okay, prove it. They sold him to Egypt. Not only was he able to retain and even increase his level of spirituality, he merited to bring up children whose spiritual commitment mirrored his own. Now, the book begins with first man being named by God. He was named Adam. Some say because he was created from the Adama, the Hebrew word for earth. This may be why we refer to Mother Earth. Others say the earth was given its name once man was created from it. Now, Yosef was given an Egyptian name by Paro. It's Phanas Paneach, which some say means the revealer of secrets. However, the book ends with mention of only his Hebrew name, Yosef, which means to add. It would seem that he never used his Egyptian name. We are told by the, our sages that the Jews in Egypt were redeemed because of three merits, one of them being they did not change their names. This they had learned from Yosef. We also learned from Yosef that a Jew should never be content with where he is in life. He should always be trying to, Yosef, add, to grow on all levels. So Yosef was able to save not only himself and his children, but he also saved his father, brothers, and all their families. In addition, at the same time, he was able to save the whole world from dying during the years of famine. So we see that Yosef was able to take over where Adam, first man, had failed. His Egyptian name, Sfasas Paneach, has numerical value, gematria of 828, the same as the Hebrew words Tikva Chadasha, a new hope. With him, a new hope was born in the world. In the Haftorah, the reading from Tanakh, which deals with the death of Dovinamel, King David, we see another connection between Yosef and Adam. The Medrash tells us that Yaakov was supposed to live to the age of 180, which was the same age as his father Yitzchak. However, when Yosef introduced him to Paro, Paro asked Yaakov his age, since he looked so old. He told Paro that he looked older than his years due to the difficulties that he had experienced in his life. And since he complained to Paro about the quality of his life, which were spoken in 33 words, 33 years were taken from his life. Again, God judges a tzaddik, l'chut sarot, to a hair's breadth. Yosef was also supposed to live longer than his years. However, since he had assured his brothers that he, using the word anochi, I, would provide for their needs, instead of attributing the credit to God, he was the first of the brothers to die. So, did Yosef, so Yosef did not live as long as his father, which was 147 years, but he died 37 years earlier at the age of 110. There's another medrash that says that David was supposed to die, actually, within three months of birth. However, he received, received, received his 70 years of life as a gift from Adam, first man, which was his lifespan. There's another medrash, though, that states that David received 
33 years from Yaakov and 37 years from Yosef, that before Adam died, he changed his mind, so to speak, had regret. So we see that both David and, pardon me, Adam and Yosef are connected to David Amalek, King David. The Medrash says that Adam was extremely handsome and that Yaakov's features resembled those of Adam. It also states that Yosef looked like his father, which of course would have connected him to Adam. In addition, as we mentioned, Yaakov complained to Paro about the first 130 years of his life being very difficult. I find it interesting that the first 130 years of Adam's life were also difficult. He spent them separated from Chava in penitence for his sin. Now, according to the Rambam, the descent, according to the Rambam, the descent of Yosef and Yaakov to Egypt alludes to the Roman exile, which we are still presently in today. It was the brothers themselves who, by selling Yosef into slavery, caused their own sentence to be exiled to Egypt, and so too with our present exile, which came about with Hyrcanus Her 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 and Aristobulus, the two sons of King Alexander Yanai. Both contended that the kingship should be theirs. After their father died, their mother, Queen Alexandra Salome, took over the rulership. When she died, the crown should have passed to her firstborn son, Hyrcanus, but Aristobulus refused to concede the throne to his older brother and incited a civil war. Each faction sought to enlist the Roman general Pompey in its cause. Pompey eventually besieged and entered Jerusalem. This began the Roman domination of Judea. Once the Romans were invited into Israel, they never left. And this was the beginning of the end for the Jewish nation. Yaakov went to Egypt because of a famine, taking his whole family with him. During the destruction of the Second Temple, it was the famine, the siege of the city, that allowed the Romans to capture Yerushalayim, destroy the Temple, and take the whole nation into exile. Rabbi Victor Miller says that with the story of Yosef, we see much more than just the life of one individual or just one family. We see within Yosef the story of the history of the Jewish nation. Yosef was given a coat of many colors by his father, which increased the hatred that his brothers felt towards him. We too were chosen by God Almighty to receive a multifaceted Torah. With this gift, we arouse the envy and hatred of the nations of the world. As we see, the Torah was given on Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. The word Sinai alludes to the Hebrew word Sina which means hatred. The Tanchum in Devarim 7 states that the book and the sword came down to this earth together. The only way to be saved from one is to cling to the other. Yosef had dreams of grandeur, which he related to his brothers. The dreams only managed to stoke the flames of hatred and jealousies that his brothers already felt towards him. We too have had prophets throughout our history who have prophesied about all the greatness that has and will belong to the Jewish nation, chosen. <laughs> the big question is, chosen for what? Because of their intense hatred of Yosef, his brothers sold him into slavery. They tried to rid themselves of him, but God had other plans, and so too the nations of the world. They plotted time and time again to drive us out of our land, to be foreigners in a foreign land, to wipe our memory from the face of the earth, but God has other plans. You know, they tell the story of Frederick the Great and his archbishop. Frederick the Great was a philosopher, and he would have debates with his archbishop. Again, intellectual debates. One day they were debating about God, and the archbishop was trying to prove to Frederick that God existed, and whatever argument the archbishop proposed, Frederick had a counter-argument. Finally, with nothing else left, the archbishop looked at Frederick and he said, the proof that there is a God in the world is that there's a Jew in the world. Frederick said, I accept that. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Yosef. She used every feminine wild at her disposal to try and have him succumb to her advances. So too the nations of the world have attempted to seduce us and draw us away from our Yiddishkeit. 
sometimes with kind words, wealth, and position, other times with threats and brutality. Yosef was falsely accused of raping his mistress, and he was thrown into a prison. We too, through the years, have been accused unjustly by the nations of all types of crimes. We have been forced to suffer the pains of prison, expulsion, and even torturous deaths. They have robbed us of our money and poisoned the minds of our children. Yosef is the first of our ancestors to be called a tzaddik, a righteous one. Our rabbis tell us that tzaddik yesod olam, that a righteous man is the foundation of the world. So why is the story of Yosef so important to us, especially in our generation? Simple. He managed to attain his elevated position under the most difficult of circumstances against all odds. He was the first to bring up his children under the pressures of an immoral and permissive society, a society whose main objective was self-gratification rather than connecting and serving the creator of the world. But just as he was aware of the importance of bringing up his children to live <clears throat> to the exemplary lives, he did not forget about himself. Many times we as parents are so involved with the lives of our children that we forget that we too are children. We have a responsibility to learn Torah, to develop our character traits, and to serve God to the best of our abilities. We should never be content with yesterday's accomplishments. We should always strive to do better, to grow. Yosef is our example in the exile of how we can be Torah-observant Jews in a secular society with all of its demands and distractions. How can we face the challenge of being productive members of society and at the same time serving God with all of our hearts? But just like Yosef was saved by God from the dark and deep pit that he had been incarcerated in, and in a matter of moments, he was brought up from the darkest depths to the light of day. Instantly he went from shame to all types of honor and glory. And so too, will we in the end be redeemed by our Father in heaven, who in the presence of all the nations of the world will then bestow upon us all the goodness which he had promised to our forefathers. May this have come quickly with the coming Mashiach Sikainu, quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for turning me on. And again, God should bless you with uh, health and with safety and with happiness and all that is good. Again, if there's any topic that you would like to hear about, please let us know. The, the, uh, my email account now is right here on the bottom of the page. And again, God bless and thank you for listening. Shabbat Shalom.